Let's have a prayer. Lord Jesus, we continue to rejoice that you are our risen Lord. And we ask now for the help and inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we may understand more deeply the truth about you and respond with obedience and love. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The coronation has taken place, flags and bunting have come down. There was a lot of ceremony, tradition, symbolism. It was fascinating, was it, wasn't it, to watch? And it was quite moving as well at times. And then, of course, there were all the enjoyable celebrations, including the lovely tea party, which, as much as anything, was a celebration of community. So where do we go from here? Well, the legacy is we have a king and queen, we have happy memories, but actually there should be more. And actually, I thought a bit about what the Archbishop of Canterbury said in his sermon at the coronation. I was listening. We crown a king to serve, and with the privilege of power comes the duty to serve. And a bit later, he defines service as love in action. And that's what I hope, really, that a greater sense of love and service remains for Charles, Camilla, for you, for me, and for our communities. So we're going to start by looking at that short gospel passage, which actually is a bit convoluted and probably quite hard to digest, but it contains important truths. This is part of the conversation that Jesus had with his disciples, warning them about the future and reassuring them that he was the way, the truth and the life. And he gives the assurance that his imminent departure from them is not a final bereavement, but is necessary for his going to prepare a place for them, the many rooms where they may be with him in the future. And he tells them they will not be alone, for he promises them the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says he'll ask the Father who will send the Spirit to be with them and within them. There was some confusion in a Welsh parish a little time ago, because both curates who arrived were called Evans. One became informally known as Evans the Trinity, and the other as Evans the Holy Ghost. Both of them were quite flattered to hear this, until they heard why they'd been called these names. One was incomprehensible, and the other invisible. And the confusion got worse because a new erector arrived and he was called Evans, but he was quickly called Evans above. <laughs> so Jesus promises that he will come back to them and they may abide in him and he in them, just as he and the Father abide in each other. Now, we sometimes describe Jesus abiding with us as Jesus living in our hearts. He's not separated from us in any way. It basically means becoming one with or united to Jesus, just as Jesus is united or at one with his Father. When we're at one with someone, it means our purpose, aims, thinking, actions are along the same lines. Our concerns and our joys are shared. The Holy Spirit draws us in a wonderful way into the community of God, the community of Father, Son and Spirit, who love and serve each other along a common will, a common purpose. So we are aligned with God. I think abiding also has a sense of resting and staying. It's not temporary. It's permanent. It's a living reality. Jesus links this abiding to our love and obedience, and both of them are needed. For love, apart from obedience, would open the way to a purely emotional, maybe even sentimental, interpretation of being with God. To speak of obedience apart from love would open the way, perhaps, to a slave mentality, but Jesus speaks a bit later about us being his friends, not slaves. We don't very often think about obedience. We prefer to speak of love. 
But actually, obedience is linked to love because obedience is how we show love. Love is the motivation for our obedience. Jesus says then that this indwelling of God with his people is made possible by the coming of another advocate, the spirit of truth, the gift of the Father. There's a close connection between Jesus coming to them and giving the spirit to them. The other counsellor, the advocate, unlike Jesus, will be with his disciples forever. We are approaching Ascension Day. Jesus is no longer with us physically. Jesus then can only be with us now by the coming of the Spirit. So what does Jesus mean by describing the Spirit as the advocate? The Greek word that John uses, that is translated advocate, gives us the word paraclete, which you may have heard of. This word occurs in three chapters of John's Gospel only. It also occurs in 1 John, where it's used of Jesus. Again, it's translated as advocate. Throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is variously described. In the New Testament, particularly as counsellor, comforter, helper, and advocate. Showing that the Greek is richer in meaning than the English. And the Holy Spirit does a whole host of things. He is hard to pin down, and yet he transforms our lives. He is God with us now. I heard some years ago that the Bible Society were working on a translation of John's Gospel into the Kare language, spoken in equatorial Africa. They came to chapter 14. They were trying to work out the local word to describe the paraclete. They thought a bit about comforter, helper, or the like. But then they found the answer, the perfect equivalent. In the local culture, if one in a line of porters became exhausted from carrying his heavy load, another would bend down to help him up. He is known in Kare as the one who falls down beside us. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit, the one who falls down beside us and with us. So Jesus is the original counsellor or advocate, and the one who intercedes with the Father for the disciples, who comforts and encourages them in any times of distress or anxiety. And we may remember that this chapter, chapter 14, begins with Jesus saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. He, of course, is the comforter in action, but he is sending them another counsellor, the spirit of truth, who will always be with them. His comforting, though, is linked to the truth, is the communication of the truth, is the communication about Jesus who said he is the truth. And his work is to interpret to the disciples the words and work of Jesus, to make known the truth of the love that Jesus has for us, to confront the world with the truth of the gospel. This counsellor, the Holy Spirit, will come at Pentecost to dwell in the disciples. And because Jesus is also abiding in the Spirit as part of the Trinity, we're abiding with Jesus too, as well as with his Father. It's a complicated thought, isn't it? But in some mysterious way, we are invited to belong to the whole of God and to experience his love and presence with us through the power of the Spirit. This gift has been made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection for Jesus and for his disciples gives us new life lived out in the power of the Spirit. And it is obedience and love that make this relationship possible. And of course, will also flow from it. What does it mean for you and me? I think it is a reminder of the breadth of privileges we have as followers of Christ. Jesus promises that the one who loves him will not only be able to continue to know the Father, but will have the Father and the Son dwelling within them through the Spirit. The disciples 
now are in a position of greater privilege than they were when Jesus was with them physically. And so are we. This is a passage showing us the closest possible relationship with Jesus and our loving Heavenly Father. They are alive in our hearts. Isn't that amazing? And it's a promise. We're never going to be alone. God is always with us. Not just out there. He's there within us. And secondly, I hope we've been reminded of the importance of love and obedience. They need to remain together, of course. Jesus spoke of the importance of remaining obedient to his words and the fact that this is what indicates a person's genuine love for Jesus. It's not about earning our salvation, but it's a mark of someone who loves Jesus. The great command of Jesus was about love of God and neighbour. So Christian discipleship is a call to worship, to serve and to witness. And of course, we are not to let our hearts be troubled. Aren't they tremendous words of hope and comfort when these times are uncertain, when they are perhaps a bit of anxiety about the future for all of us? There is pain for some. But we don't have anything to fear. God, the Holy Spirit, our paraclete, our comforter, our helper, our advocate, our counsellor is within us. Nothing can separate us from that. And he will bring us his hope, his comfort, his consolation, and his enabling. And make Jesus real to us. So, as the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 15, may the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.